All right, guys, Murph's here. And today I want to talk about this, a Sega 308-1 chambered in 308. This is our latest in the Friendly Fire series, the series where I review guns out of my friends' collections so that we can remove my personal purchase bias and discuss at the end of it whether or not I would buy it and what changes I would make. Now with that, why don't we go ahead and get into a little bit of history. Now, in the 1970s, the Russian AK manufacturer Izmosh would decide to go ahead and diversify into civilian semi-automatic rifles. Now, this might be surprising to some, but there has been some ownership in Russia and other surrounding former Soviet bloc states of private firearms. However, it's also been a very heavily regulated practice with gun laws that are not too dissimilar from some of the more restrictive states gun laws in the United States. Now that cartridge or that rifle would initially be chambered in the 220 Russian cartridge, excuse me, almost said Swift, but no, the 220 Russian and would not really be a success. So instead they would start producing in the 1980s rifles produced in 762 by 39 and 545. In the 1990s, with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the start of commerce between the former Soviet bloc states and the United States, they would start importing these rifles in the same layout chambered in 223 and 308. Now, these rifles would come in relatively inexpensively. However, they would never really do all that great in sales. And I think there's a couple of reasons. We look at a very different Second Amendment community firearms landscape dynamic in the 1990s to where rifles are hunting rifles for the most part, or there's something that like law enforcement, which really in the 1990s, rifles are not that prevalent in law enforcement. It's kind of on the, it's on an uptick, but it's not where it is now. Or they're what the military uses. Shotguns are what you use for home defense or to go hunting. And handguns were what you used for personal defense outside of the home. If you even indulged in that, it was likely that you just took handguns to the range to make noise. So for this rifle, being semi-automatic, it had less appeal to the hunting crowd. Not to say it didn't have any appeal, just that it had less appeal. Hunters were more likely to reach for bolt-action rifles than they were for semi-automatic. And then when you also bring into account that it was an imported firearm from the Russians, it kind of suffered in popularity. Now, this would also come imported alongside of these Sega 12-gauge shotguns, which do a little bit better, but that's more because there's uh, inherent interest for most people when it comes to a semi-automatic AK style shotgun. Now in 2014, there would be a stop to all importation of Russian produced firearms. So these rifles and the Sega 12 gauges would stop coming in. And since then, they've more or less kind of just puttered along on the aftermarket ever since then. All right, guys, that's history. Why don't we go ahead and start talking about the features of this particular rifle? Right off the bat, we have a 21 and a half inch cold hammer forged chrome line barrel. Now, something that kind of disappoints me about this barrel and the light just kind of drew my eye to it is that I can still see a lot of machine marks on it. But, you know, I guess you win some and lose some. These were like under $400 rifles when they first came into the country. Now, as you can see here, we have a standard AK style front sight, which is adjustable for both elevation and windage. And you'll also note that we do not have any type of muzzle device, which is not odd for this time period. This would have come in probably during the assault weapons ban between 1994 and 2004, which would have banned the ability for rifles to have some sort of, or one of the banned features would be the ability to be able to have flash hiders, muzzle compensators, any of those types of things. Because apparently that is what changes this rifle from being a tool to a godless killing machine. Now, coming back to our gas system, we do have the AK long stroke gas piston. We will get into that more here in just a little bit. You will note that we do not have the normal kind of wood handguard up around the gas tube, but we do have a wooden handguard around the bottom of it. And true to AK style, there's a lot of wobble in it. But it's relatively comfortable. It's actually quite hand filling. I don't hate this handguard by any means. Now our rear sight is actually kind of laughable. We do have a tangent type rear sight, which is adjustable for elevation. And we will note that it tops out at 300 meters. And we just ha we have all of this rear sight. Like there's not an unsubstantial amount of rear sight here, 
to only be marked out to, marked out to 300. And this is pretty typical for Sega rifles. Even the AKs would only be marked out to 300. And it's pretty much because these came off the same production line as AK-47s. So they took those rear sights and just didn't mill as many cuts, didn't fill in as many numbers. All right, this is a stamped receiver gun. We will note that we have a bulged RPK style trunnion here. We have the standard AK side mounted charging handle. We have our standard AK lever type safety slash dust cover. On the side of the receiver, we do have an AK style optics mount, which when it comes to AK optics mounting solutions, this is my preferred mounting setup, but we'll talk about this more here in a bit. This is a Russian style PSO scope that is illuminated with this having markings in English, I am kind of of the assumption that this was produced specifically for the American market, but I also don't really have anything to prove that with. So I, I had some difficulty finding information about both this rifle and this optic. Now, when it comes to the illuminated reticle, the owner has managed to use this before. As you can see, he's got a AA battery in here. However, this is not actually built to run off a of AA. So generally he puts a little bit of aluminum foil down to the bottom of it and he manages to finally be able to achieve contact with the contacts that need to be achieved and gets the illuminated reticle to work. I didn't really bother with it because I've been shooting in high visibility conditions with it. All right, now let's go ahead and hop into the guts here real quick because we do have some things that we can discuss here. Now, as we can see, we have what appears to be a standard AK bolt and spring arrangement, but just how standard are they? Now, one other thing I wanna point out before we get too far, we do have the standard lever type setup in order to be able to take off this gas tube, should we so choose. Now, I also happen to have my PSL 54C, previously reviewed on the channel, link in the description. So, this is also a rifle chambered for a full power rifle cartridge not necessarily an intermediate cartridge. How do the pieces and parts compare between the two? So recoil springs right off the bat. As we can see, the Sega's is a little bit shorter than the PSL 54's recoil spring. Let's take a look at the bolt, or let's take first a look at the piston assembly, which we can see that there's a substantial difference in piston length between the two rifles. This is more akin to a standard AK-47 length piston rod, whereas this is something that was designed to work with a 7.62x5.4. So that is very interesting. As we can look at our carrier, our, between the carriers here, we can see yet again that there's a substantial size difference between them. And getting into the bolts, now this does have the long, thin stem bolt arrangement, this being the Sega 308. And if we compare this, to our PSL 54C, we see a substantial difference in bolt length here and thickness. This is a much thicker bolt. So we see that what it basically looks like Sega did, or Eismosh did, was take an AK receiver and build its bolt face and the barrel and all that kind of stuff around the 308. Kept everything else with more or less 7.62 by 3.9 length components or sized components. Which is interesting. There's, it's, there's a, a utility that's associated in that when it comes to cost and all that kind of stuff. Now you, you know what, before I get this all closed all the way up, we can go ahead and call attention to this. Now we'll see here, we have some grooves cut into the bolt head which we do not have on the Sega. This means the PSL 54C yet again. Now also, of course, the PSL 54C is a little bit longer. It's about three inches longer overall. Something else to call attention to while I put this back together. Hang on a second, might, might go crazy. Now, something else to call attention to while I'm sitting here with you guys is that the Sega does not have a grooved top cover. All right, I think we're done with the PSL 54C for now. Let's go ahead and put the 
Sega back together real quick. Now, something else to point out while I got the Sega open right now is that there's actually a linkage that connects our trigger to the hammer because the trigger guard is set further back on these Sega rifles. I actually have my Zestava z -Pack M70, previously reviewed on the channel, link in the description, right here so we can kind of express that comparison. So when I line up the ends of the receiver here, we can note, it's kind of a lot to wrangle, but you'll see what I'm, what I'm getting at here. The trigger guard for the Sega is back here about where the pistol grip on the ZPAP is and the ZPAP trigger guard is out further in front of where it's at on the Sega. And if we take that, I guess we're not done with the PSL 54 c Let me wrangle this around. And if we do that, same comparison, the PSL 54 c is set a little bit further forward. You guys can see that a little bit further forward than the Sega. So that requires there to be a linkage that goes from the trigger to the hammer, which really changes the dynamic on the trigger pull for this particular rifle. Now, something else that I've noticed in reassembling this rifle, and this is just like, you know, some kind of MRF observations, the practice of placing the dovetail for the recoil spring just in front of the dovetail that it mates into in the receiver and then putting your top cover on and then running the charging handle in order to get it to seat properly and easily does not work on this. So what I found is that I got to line up the top cover and then depress the button, the plunger on the back the recoil spring just a little bit and then I can get in there no problem which you actually have a little additional shelf on this button for the recoil spring in order to be able to do that is what I would surmise now the trigger let's go ahead and talk about that for a second since we already started that conversation so I have a lot of take up and then I get I feel tension and a lot of it but I never really have a wall and then I have a ton of over travel after the shot breaks. It puts me well out ahead of the wall. Again, there's no distinct wall at all. And then the shot breaks. Now, of course, I have these other two AK style rifles and neither one of them necessarily have triggers to write home about. We have a TAPCO G2 in the PSL 54C and we have whatever the TAPCO equivalent is in the ZPAP M70. Both of those have kind of rolling breaks. However, there's at least some semblance of a wall, whereas the Sega just kind of just keeps going. It just kind of keeps rolling, 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 and it's really not a good trigger by any means. I have, I have some minor complaints when it comes to this trigger. Now guys, I'm no trigger snob by any means. I'm not gonna sit around here and tell you that the accuracy capabilities of this rifle are entirely dependent upon me being able to manipulate the trigger properly. However, it is something that might be important to you, the buyer, so I go ahead and address it whenever it is that I get the opportunity. Now, when it comes to magazines, we have the standard AK style rock and lock system, and this rifle would have shipped with these 10 round magazines. Now, originally, you would only be able to use 10 round magazines with this rifle. Part of that has to come in with it you know, being imported during the assault weapons ban, and the other part has to do with the shell guide or the cartridge guide being built into the magazine. Normally that is built into the receiver of your AKs. However, this lacks that. So it cannot necessarily work with high capacity magazines that don't have this guide. Now, in the present environment, you're in luck because I have been able to find some magazines out on the market that are higher capacity, 24, 25 rounds, that do have the guide built into the magazine. So those apparently do exist. I was actually just looking at them a little bit earlier, trying to make sure that they had the guide on them. So. You can get higher capacity magazines for these rifles now. All right, let's go ahead and talk about our stock real quick. So we have a semi pistol grip, which on sporting type rifles I like in order to be able to really pull the rifle up into my shoulder. We have a small amount of texturing on the grip here, which really doesn't do a whole lot. 
We have a not unsubstantial cheek riser built into the rifle to be able to work with this kind of offset mount. We'll talk about this more here in a bit. We have a pretty substantial rubber recoil pad. And then of course this rifle came with sling swivels, though only one still remains on the rifle. All right, guys, that's features. How does it shoot? So when it comes to recoil and pulse, I don't notice a lot of recoil with this rifle, even being kind of a condensed, you know, more or less a, an upgunned 7.62x39 AK, I don't notice a, a brutal amount of recoil. Now, a lot of that also comes down to, I wasn't shooting this dynamically, I wasn't running it like a tactical rifle because it's not a tactical rifle. It is very much so a sporting type rifle. We'll get into that subject more here in just a little bit. Now, when it came to accuracy, accuracy was a little underwhelming which is not shocking when you consider that this is uh, an AK. It's an AK for all intents and purposes. It just happens to look like a hunting rifle. So the group that I got out of this that I have for record, and I'll, I'll roll in an image of it here, was with uh, Aguila 150 grain FMJ, and I managed to get a 3 and 1 8 inch group out of it. Not exactly stellar. That was pretty consistent with the rifle overall. Now, a couple of things, a couple of things to discuss here. First off, keep in mind, this rifle does not match my face very well. And it has a lot to do with this cheek riser and this offset optic type mount. This is one of the things that I really hate about Soviet or Russian, you know, Eastern European optics setups. I, I have the same complaint on the PSL 54C. So I guess I have a kind of oddly shaped face for these purposes. The SOP mod stock on an AR-15 annoys me because they're very beefy and it has a tendency when I get my good cheek to stock weld to kind of push me off of the rifle because I have cheekbones. So I have a difficult time viewing the sights in the way that I want to and I generally avoid SOP mod stocks. There are a couple of exceptions to SOP mod-esque designs that are not as beefy, not as drastic of an angle, but I avoid stop mod stocks for the most part. Now, with these types of rifles, you actually want a pretty substantial cheek riser to be able to push it over. So a stop mod type setup would be helpful to me, but there's one other issue with AK style rifles, and that is the height over bore. This optic sits, sits substantially higher than where my face lines up on it. So this runs into another issue to where I'm not necessarily coming in on my cheekbones, I'm coming in more down here where my face is a little bit more angular which means that I don't really have a good cheek to stock well whenever it is that I'm trying to line up behind this optic. And I'm kind of floating out in space at times. I have to turn my head a little bit uncomfortably, kind of get my neck into an uncomfortable position in order to be able to have contact with the stock and still be able to look through the optic.
So how does this translate into shooting dynamic with this rifle? Well, it translates because I have to spend more time reacquiring my sight picture in between shots. And that's kind of annoying, to put it lightly. It's almost like shooting a bolt action rifle if you were to like break your cheek to stock weld every time you cycled the action. It, it almost takes as much time for me to be able to stay behind the optic on this as it would a bolt action. And I don't expect that to be the case when it comes to a semi-automatic rifle. So that's a relatively minor complaint. There are things that you could do in order to be able to change this dynamic with this rifle. It's just not mine to do it with. Now reliability was 100% as you would expect with an AK style rifle. And I think that pretty much covers my thoughts on shooting. Now, would I buy it? And the answer is no. And that is entirely because I don't do a lot of hunting and I have no real interest in using this as a hunting type rifle. I, I have hunting rifles. I have a couple of hunting rifles for when I did go hunting. And I have a couple of other things, the PSL 54C included, that I would love to take hunting. But this is too niche of a product for me. It doesn't, it doesn't really fit the aesthetic that I want enough to be able to put this into my repertoire of hunting options. All right, now, what would I recommend this rifle for? Would I recommend this as a duty type offering? In its present configuration, no. There are a ton of better purpose suited options for duty type work. Now, I could see if you were perhaps like a, a park ranger or something like that in Alaska, or you were a, some type of police officer in a more wilderness type location, this wouldn't be the worst option ever, but I think a, an AR-10 would probably serve your needs just as well and be a lot more adaptable to your scenarios. Okay, well, what about home defense? Well, this rifle, once again, would not be my first choice. It's first off a lot of power, so it really depends on where it is that you're living. You're talking about a full power rifle cartridge moving at significant velocities and probably causing more than one hole in not only the intruder, but your house. So that's something you have to take into account whenever it is that you're talking about using this for defensive type purposes. I could see this being an okay option for uh, a, a truck gun around a farm or something like that, or if you were a, a rancher of some sort and you wanted to have something available to be able to take on a wide variety of varmints, be it of the two or four legged variety, as well as be able to take some pot shots or something like that, this wouldn't be the worst choice ever. But I can also once again think of much better, more modern modular options than this particular rifle. What about a competition rifle? Absolutely not. It's pretty much all we have to say about that. All right, Murph, now let's say if you did have to buy this, what would you do with it? Well, that's actually a very interesting question because there's actually a, a semi-thriving market built around the Sega-style rifles to where you can actually adapt AK parts. You can get the stock taken out and an AK style talk, stock incorporated, excuse me. You can get an AK style pistol grip. Now you're gonna have to have all these components move forward. And there's gonna be a lot of changes that need to be made in this receiver in order to be able to do that. But you could hang an awful lot of accessories off of this rifle. And with the availability of higher capacity magazines that do have the feeding guide, or if you decided to install the cartridge feeding guide in there for this rifle, you could get a lot of adaptability if you had an interest in an AK-308. Which, I mean, Zestava has shown that there is at least a little bit of interest in 308 caliber AKs. Now, the owner of this rifle bought this as a, as a, or has this as a hunting rifle and has hunted with it over the years. And he has given some consideration to trying to do kind of a, a homemade or, you know, Americanized Dragunov type setup out of this rifle. But one thing to point out with this option is that it would be rather expensive. But again, and you know, I'm kind of like caveating off of my own caveats here at this point. If you were to tell me, if you were to give me this rifle, here you go, Murph, this is your rifle now. Uh, do with it what you will. And the option, if one of the options is not selling it, if I think that's somehow going to negatively impact our friendship and I truly value your friendship at that point, then. I would start looking for ways to be able to make this a practical rifle to me, and I would probably look at going along the the Dragunov type, you know, PSL influenced 
modifications. If not, perhaps chopping the barrel down to 16 inches and turning it into a pretty handy AK battle rifle, which is kind of an interesting option all by itself. And there are a couple people on the internet who have done those types of builds. All right, guys. I think that pretty much covers my thoughts on this particular subject. I hope you found this interesting, and that's pretty much what I got. Have a good day. Well, dusty, eh? Yeah, I mean, it just sits on the bedside table.